Welcome back to Golden Roll Radio. We were in Denver this week, and all of you that came to see us, we appreciate that. And if you weren't there, oh boy, you missed some some good analysis, Dave and Don McIlvaney. And we're going to be doing another tour coming in October, November, more to the Midwestern states and Eastern states. So be on the lookout for those dates. So each week, you know that we categorically tend to focus on things like the central banks and the U.S. dollar and the metals prices and all that. So if we take a step back and provide you sort of that bird's eye view this week and we start with the U.S. dollar, guys, where would you go? Well, I thought we had about two more points up from 102 to 104. So short term, I did think it was going up. Um, and it almost got to 104. And we did almost get to 104. So, But yeah, the dollar down 10% this year, along with how many other currencies? I think about all of them. Yeah, and that's the whole thing about the currency markets. All fiat currencies are declining. And that's what you have to understand is over time, you're losing purchasing power regardless of the currency that you're in, right? But they're all declining at different rates. And so you see this dollar index fluctuate. You know, looking back, I mean, the dollar's down 86% in its purchasing power in the last 50 years. The real reason that you own physical gold as a hedge is because you want to be immune to that loss of purchasing power. And we certainly understand that even though we also do a weekly technical show, you're really doing yourself a disservice just looking at the day-to-day, week-to-week technicals without taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Because you can watch Fox News or you can watch MSNBC. You can see the price of stocks going up and down and you can think, hey, I must be doing great. But let's be honest, is your cost of living changing? I think the point of talking about the dollar being down 10% this year and 86% over 50 years or 90 something percent over 100 years, the point is, is that the longer that you sit in a fiat currency, the more value you lose. So the actionable item there would be to get out of the fiat currency and into something more stable. Gold over time has done that trick. That doesn't mean you keep no dollars. It just means you need a lot less dollars. I think we've always said three to six months worth of living expenses in cash outside the banking system so that you can pay your bills for those three months. Anything more than that, and you're just getting your value deteriorated over time. A lot of people use the terminology for the equities markets being propped up by the central banks. And for me, propped up means that you're just having a support that's underneath it, which that, that seems apparent with the plunge protection team coming in in the last crisis. But I think this market is actually dri- being driven higher by the central banks providing liquidity. Actually, central banks, the Bank of Japan, Swiss National Bank, actually going in and buying significant, right. significant amounts of equities. That's what's driving the market higher. So when they stop doing that or when they decide to get liquid, That's when I think we actually roll over with the equities market. And they're already talking about trimming their balance sheets, right? I mean, their balance sheets have grown substantially, quadrupled in the last 10 years. So they've added a trillion dollars just in the first quarter of 2017 alone. So at some point, that game must end, to your point, Robert. Again, listener, diversify. Yeah, one of the Fed's Federal Reserve's mandates is price stability. Well, we all assumed the price stability was the price of goods and services and things like that. That seems like a legitimate way of addressing price stability. But I think that mandate has actually been price stability into the equities markets. And the assumption is that the market's going to continue going higher. Well, that price stability to continue to rise those prices, I think that is their new definition of price stability. So when you look at the upside potential in the equities market at this point, paling in comparison probably to what the downside potential could be if we see another type of crash like 2008. And again, we've talked about these technicals for months now on the show. There's a number of reasons why you should see the same type of correction we saw in 08. Wouldn't you like to get out before the 50% drop this time and put yourself into a more protective position so that you can get back into the equities at a much more favorable price. One example is from yesterday, I was doing a consultation with a lady and her husband, and she had a 401k that she'd already left the employer, and the 401k was sitting there in a fund that had a target of, I think, 2030, so 2030. And in that fund, she didn't know what was there. Uh, She didn't know the composition. I asked her what the symbol was. She didn't know what the symbol was. So she's in this fund with about $150,000 sitting there. And she asks, well, what should I do with it? Well, 
what's it invested in? And so as I pulled the fund, I looked at it, looked at the details of it. It was 60 something percent equities, 30% bonds. I just asked her, would you like to be protected from the mar- next market decline? Or do you think that the market's going to continue higher? And her answer was, I think, fairly obvious, was that she wanted to get out of harm's way, wanted to get off the railroad tracks because she didn't even know what was in the fund. So it was going to correlate, that fund was going to correlate with the equities market, which the upside, sure, we could see the next few years of the market going higher. But eventually, I think that downside risk just overweights the potential for gain versus loss. So you mentioned bonds there. You guys have concerns about the bond market? How heartbreaking would it be to be in the bond market right now (laughs) where the interest rates are? Or to be, especially in in your client's case, locked into a fund that A, your entire life savings, you have no idea what it's invested in. And B, a healthy chunk of it is invested in some of the lowest interest rates we've ever seen. Bonds have been in a bull market for 30 something years with interest rates coming down from the early 1980s at about 15%. Um, Pat the guy on the back who locked that interest rate in. Uh, But for the last 30 something years, we've been in decline with the interest rates, meaning if you guys understand this, bond prices have been rising. That is a long term cycle. And it's been probably seven or eight years now where the bond market has been continuing to kind of eke up, inch up, melt up, however you want to say it. And eventually, I think it goes the other direction. And I just wouldn't want to be sitting there in a retirement fund that says you're going to retire in 2020, 2030, 20, whatever the number is, look at what makes up those funds. And it's a mix of equities and bonds. It's incredible. I think the number of people that own bonds and don't even know what a bond is, uh, is immeasurable. And to me, it's the biggest bubble in history. You know, it's valued at over 100 trillion. All it takes is one domino to kick off. It could happen in China, it could happen in Europe, it could be here in the US, but it will have a global effect when the bond market starts to flip over. And it did, it topped a year ago. I mean, we're seeing in the US market interest rates start to climb. The bond market topped a year ago. What are you doing? And just to note, the Fed doesn't actually control the interest rates on the bond market. They can control their lending rate, but they're not controlling the actual market rate the market always wins. The central bank might think they're in control, but the bond market will dictate. In 2008, as Bush was leaving power, we had our first bailout. If you guys remember and look at the timeline, it was actually under Bush that we first did the the first emergency, emergency bailout. TARP. Then we had another bailout. Then we had another bailout. And there may be too many for me to even list and be accurate about it, but then you had the Federal Reserve enter into a policy that was exactly what the Germans did, which caused the Weimar Republic and uh, crazy hyperinflation in that country. There are other examples throughout history where the same type of thing happens. Basically what it is, it's the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. It's where your own government central bank prints money or creates money out of thin air by hitting a few numbers on a keyboard and hitting enter. That's how they can create trillions of dollars. They did that to buy the government bonds. And so now that Fed balance sheet is bloated with this stuff. Bonds, it's bloated with it. And it's sitting there and they're talking about trying to get out of these bonds. They're trying to to unwind those positions that they took on. How are they going to do that? Who's going to be buying those bonds if they try to sell them into the marketplace? Well, it's the nature of how markets work, right? Buyers have to equal sellers. So if you have way too many sellers, like in the case of the Fed trying to get rid of all these bonds, and not enough buyers to offset it, you have to drop the price till you have enough buyers to offset it. So I have been asked the question before, well, if they issued the bonds and they own the bonds, can't they just get rid of the bonds? I think they could. Just delete them right off their balance sheet. That's been, I think, probably talked about. But what happens to every other bond that's part of that market if all of a sudden the Fed can just both create and destroy whatever they want to? It completely illegitimizes everything else within the bond market. So it's kind of a terrifying thought, especially when you think of who owns the majority of American debt right now, China. The rest of the world knows what's going on with this game. I mean, the Fed has created this game, right, for the last hundred and something years. They've purposely created this environment. And now they're talking about trying to unwind their positions and all this. The rest of the world sees it. 
And if you're going to do that type of behavior, which I think is just immoral, but it's a totally different conversation. You know, Proverbs says something like an unequal balance of measure is an abomination of God. Well, what do we have with our monetary system here? We have that unequal balance of measure. And here we are with the rest of the world seeing it clearly, and it delegitimizes the whole system, which is the Federal Reserve, which is kind of the whole United States government's plan. It delegitimizes that, right? I mean, who's going to trust that environment? Who wants to hold on to a piece of paper that is being just gutted? So, Miles, yeah. you brought up debt. You mentioned debt. Let's let's focus on that for a little bit because that is the elephant in the room, right? When everybody's looking at the stock market and they're looking at interest rates and they're looking at the currencies, it's, to me, about debt. And we have a total global debt of over $225 trillion, right, which is 325% of global GDP. Wait, wait, one more time. 325%. So it's three and a quarter times what the entire planet creates on an annual basis. <laughs> That's Our right. debt. Our de- <clears throat> That's. I think it'd still be bad at like 32% more than what we create. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. Um, what if you added up your mortgage and your car payment and your monthly living expenses and your kids' college expenses and retirement and insurance and everything else? Oh, you forgot savings. You, and you say, gotta oh, try, yeah. to, try to save some money at the same time. No, there's no savings in this. This is <laughs> debt. So what if you added all of that up and you said, okay, I owe 150 grand a year, but I only make 40. There you go. How, can, how come you can't keep just delaying that? But the federal government can. It's a burn rate. Your burn rate is way too high relative to what you're bringing in. And every central bank and every government is seeing it. Look, the reality is every government is broke, right? And that's why you're not going to see aggressive rate hikes. You're not going to see interest rates. You can't afford an economic downturn or any further stagnation. Because the debt service that they are facing on the debt that they're sitting on is already insurmountable. And it doesn't take much when you're at a 1% interest rate and all you do is hike to 2%. Do you understand that your debt service just doubled? What if your credit card company came and adjusted and you had a 10% interest rate and all of a sudden they flipped it to 20? What does that do to your monthly budget? Well, and the terrifying thing with debt is whoever holds it last loses. So the question really ends up being over the next couple years, who's the last liar in? We're poking the bear. Rush is poking back. We're not innocent in this. We, we, we sit there and raise all this concern about North Korea firing off an ICBM. We've tested for this year alone, you know, as if we have free reign to do whatever we want to bully the other countries around the world. And you got the China Sea pressures and everything else. Come on. You know, we're putting in missile defense systems right on Russia's border. We're trying to bring Georgia into NATO. What would we be doing if Russia was doing that with Mexico and Cuba? What's this century's Franz Ferdinand? So this would be what, the defenestration of Twitter? Wouldn't it be sad if World War III starts with a tweet? So whether war is the solution, whether war happens or doesn't happen, really is is moot. The purpose of this discussion, again, is to point you to having a tangible physical hedge that's portable and it's durable and it's been proven for thousands of years and it protects you, right? So come geopolitical strains, come economic strains that we've been talking about, come financial events, uh, social or political unrest, gold is insurance against all of them. I think this comes full circle here because we go back to the dollar and you look at six months ago, seven months ago, the dollar was at 103 when we started doing this program. And who wants to accept the dollar at 103 as, as a payment? Well, okay, we, we accept it. We take it. We take uh, global trade and you get paid in dollars. And here we are now in August and the dollar's down 10%. So people who accepted dollars for trade, for payment, six months ago, seven months ago, might have been thrilled with it. But today, I mean, on that water slide that the dollar's on, do people really want to accept payment in dollars? Of course, obviously, we understand the system is set up to have dollars be what we as Americans have to use and much of the world. But as that water slide continues, is that what people want to accept? One with a couple hundred trillion in unfunded liabilities coming out of the U.S., what's the easiest way to pay it off? Pay it off with cheaper dollars. So the reason we bring up debt is just a healthy reminder that as these unfunded liabilities continue to rear their ugly heads and the payments and the bill comes due over the next couple years, the U.S. government really only has one option, 
and that's to continue to inflate and continue to devalue currency. And when you have hyperinflation, you know, it reaches a tipping point. It's like the old cash in the wheelbarrow in the Weimar Republic. You get hyperinflation because it becomes a psychological event, right? It's not a lack of dollars. There's too many dollars. Everybody gets dollars. It's just that nobody trusts them. To Robert's point, it's like, who wants it? So if nobody wants it, it doesn't matter what you're going to be trading in. And we, we look at retirement, right? You're talking about all these issues and the states and the federal government. Social Security's on the brink. States are drowning in terms of their pension funds. Are you really going to put all your eggs in that basket? Gold is guaranteed income in the years of your retirement. There are so many topics that we can address coming into the next six months. And we thank you for listening for the last six months. We look forward to this show every week. I hope you guys do too. Please give us your feedback, your questions. We thank you for listening. And we have really enjoyed the conversations that have developed from this show. And we look forward to to many more. Um, Call in, talk to us, leave comments, email us. Uh, We love to engage. So thank you again. Next week, we'll be back with our regular short technical analysis, weekly look at the precious metals and other markets. For Tori and Robert, this is Miles saying thank you again for stopping by Golden Roll Radio. Click the button below to subscribe or check us out at ICA Gold on Twitter. You can also call us at any time at one 800 525 9556. And as always, thanks for listening. Have a great week. Bye.